the, the types of memory are commonly used in computers, PLCs, because memory is memory. ROM is read-only memory. This is uh, a type of chip that's used to store code or programs that when a device first gets powered up, it goes into this chip and the program is there for it. You can only write into memory once and you use what is called a burner. So it actually burns in each memory location, whether it's a one or a zero, and it's permanent. You can't erase it, but it doesn't lose, lose any of the data if the power fails. That's why it's used for starting up devices. PLCs would have ROM in them. That's when you turn the power on, it goes in and starts running the, pro, the code. It boots off that ROM and gets the, gets the processor working. Variations on that are EEPROMs or EEPROMs, erasable, programmable read-only memory, or electrically erasable. That's just two different methods that you can rewrite them. EEPROMs, you need a burner, so you would pull the EEPROM out of the board. For example, again, this picture here shows an EEPROM in a socket like this. So you would pull it out, put it into a burner, rewrite the code, and put it back in the socket, and then boot your device again. Electrically erasable, you can do it in place. Computers now all have EEPROMs for the most part because you can download a firmware update or a BIOS update for your computer. And then there's a special procedure it uses to write into that chip. And the beauty of it is that, that it still saves all your data once the power fails. So it's safe. Um, they're not very fast. It's a slow process to rewrite them, especially if you have to pull the chip out and put it into a burner. But it's very safe. Then we get to RAM, random access memory. This is your general computer memory. Read, write, it's kind of like a chalkboard. So here, here's RAM, comes in sticks, SIMS, DIMS, single inline memory module, double inline memory module, DIPS. Um, DIPS are the old dual inline chip like that. No one uses those anymore. So various configurations, RAM versus ROM, and there, that's a DIP, dual inline package. So there's a single inline package and all different physical types of memory. Um, it's fast. You can read and write to it as many times as you want, but if you lose power, everything's erased. So it's temporary, but it's quick. NVRAM is non-volatile RAM. That's what PLCs use. It's a type of RAM that, that if you lose the power, your data is still there. And that's why you can take a PLC, write your program into it, and get it running with a machine. And if there's a power failure, the power goes out, the power comes back on, your program is still stored in that RAM. So it starts to run. And, and we have to have that in industry because you couldn't go out and reprogram every PLC every time there was a glitch in the power. So it is expensive, so they only use it when they have to, and that's why PLCs don't have huge amounts of memory, partly because you don't need huge amounts. You're not, you're not handling graphics. It's graphics that really chew up the memory, and you're not loading a lot of different programs. So going beyond that, the NVRAM in our PLC keeps your program safe anytime you get failure. So a quick review on binary basics. A bit is a single memory location. We are working with bits. When we look at an input module, there's 16 screw terminals, 16 inputs. Each one is a single bit. Put eight bits together, you get a byte. Put 16 bits together and you get a word. This is the definition. Or two bytes together make a 16-bit word. And 16 bits allows us to store a big number in there. A number between 0 and actually about 64,000. But we only use 15 of those 16 bits for the data in the PLC. The 16th one is used for the, the, um, the polarity, positive or negative. 
Um, going back a bit in history, the first computers that came out, the processors handled 8 bits. Then we got the 16-bit processors, which is what most PLCs still are, because there's no need to make them bigger. Along came Windows XP, and it was written for computers that had 32-bit architecture. And then 64 bits were Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10 processors. When we say how many bits are in the processor, that's like having 16 lanes. If you're crossing the border from Canada and the United States, and there are 16 lanes you can cross through, you choose them. If there's a long lineup, you just try and find the lane with the shortest number, the shortest lineup in it. Now, that's a 16-bit process. If you increase that to 32 or 64 lanes at, at customs, you would put a lot more cars through in a hurry. And so that's comparable to the, the number of data lines and processors. You can store larger numbers with more bits. So 16K, our, our scientific notation, K, M, G, T. Kilo, mega, giga, and tera. 16 kilobits is 16,000 bits. Normally, if we're saying kilobits, that's referring to how fast we can send data across a wire. 16 kilobits a second, 100 kilobits a second, 1 megabits, which would be 1 mi million bits per second transmitted through your Ethernet wire. If your storage you're talking about, like storing stuff on your hard drive, you're going to be talking in bytes. So 16 kilobytes would be 16,000 bytes, and each byte is 8 bits. So that would only be 8,000 kilowords, but for typically they always store it in groups of 8. It's become a standard in defining how much your memory you have in your computer. And it wouldn't actually be, for example, 1,000 kilobits, if you're talking about bytes, it would be 1024 because that's how many, if you count up in binary, that's one of the um, functions of having 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and so on, up to 1024. That's the number you get with a certain number of bits. Megabytes, million, gigabytes, billions, terabytes is a billion times a thousand more. So getting some very large numbers there. So each bit's value, if you're dealing with binary, is the number 2 to the bit to the power or exponent n. Actually, I should write that differently to get it corrected. So each bit's value is 2 to the power n, where n is which bit you're on. Bit 1, bit 2, so 2 to the power of zero, bit zero, because we actually do have a bit zero, is one. Two to the power one is two. Two to the power of two is four, and so on. So that's the number, the numeric value of that bit as we go up. So one byte or eight bits adds up to a total of 255. For 16 bits, you get a total, the largest bit is worth 32,767. So you can see the value increases of each bit. And again, this is a review. So, so hexadecimal. Um, why would we use hex? Well, we use decimal. Each digit goes up to 9, 0 to 9. And actually, if we go back to one of the previous... So here's our mechanical counter. So this goes from 0 all the way up to 9. And then it has to pass a digit to the next counter. With hexadecimal, it goes from 0 up to 9, and then it counts again using letters A, B, C, D, E, F. So we can actually get 16 values off a single digit. So this is a more efficient way of storing numbers, because we can actually use that less digits to store a larger number. If you look at license plates on cars, Every license plate has a mixture of numbers and letters. And that's because if you think with a license plate with six digits, if we only used numbers, the largest number of cars you could ever account for 
would be 999,999. ,999. That's not even 1 million cars, and there may be more than 1 million cars in Ontario. So by adding 26 more letters, we've got 10 decimals and 26 letters. We're actually base 36 on the license plates. So you can get a lot of combinations to have unique license plates. So that's what hex is. We can go from 0 to 15 on a single digit. It is used by various devices. Um, you'll see hex counters. BCD is probably more commonly, but uh, it does work. Now, here's a chart. Here's the, here's the, the values that you use in hex. And any time you're showing hex, there'll be a little h subscript. It would be a value like uh, 2, 2, 4, um, let me just, 2, 2, 4, and there would be a lowercase h in there. There. So that would, just, that would tell you that it's actually a hexadecimal value. So, then you see subscript like that. So here's a chart. Gives you a quick comparison. Comparison, decimal value, hexadecimal. There's even octal, which goes higher, and binary. So the numbers from 1 to 20. 20 in decimal is 20. In hex, it's only 14. In octal, it's 024, because it only goes up to... You'll notice octal only goes up to 8, and then it rolls over, does a carry, and uses another digit up. So it's not a very, not even as efficient as decimal. And then there's our binary values as well. So that's a nice little chart. If you ever need to convert, there are many online conversion sites where you just punch in your number in decimal. It'll give it out to you in hex, BCD, binary, or whatever you need. So move and mask. We've done the move function before. Move is just copy and paste. It takes six, all 16 bits from an address, copies them, pastes them in another memory location. So it's very simple. Now, moving with a mask, what a mask does is that zeroes out the bits that you don't want to use or, or don't want to look at. And how we do this is we use the Boolean function AND. If you AND anything with a zero, the answer is going to be zero. So here's an example. If we took the accumulated count from timer 4, and here's this very large number, and I only want to see the first four digits, that's a number between 0 and 16, because maybe I'm saying when that number hits 16, or, or 15, or 12, I want to do something with it. So you can mask this number. So these are all zeros. So if I mask everything and, and just put ones here, everything that's here will get passed through unchanged. Everything in these bits will be turned into a zero. So here's the result when I, when I mask this with this mask value. These are all zeros. And then the last four bits get passed through as they are. If you add anything with a 1, it doesn't change. So only the smallest 4 bits will show.